I think we're about ready to get started. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, this is the introduction to the Jams Graph database. Uh, my name is Jason Plurad. I'm a developer uh, in open source. I work in the IBM Cognitive Applications Group. Um, what we do is we focus on open source and uh, specifically around data and AI. Um, and what we try to do is identify open source projects that we think could be strategic to help improve our products and our services. Uh, and we reach out to those communities and try to continue to build them and grow them uh, so that way we can have a healthy ecosystem in the data and AI space. Uh, is anyone here familiar with Janus Graph? Okay, great. So Janus Graph is it's a open source scalable graph database hosted at the Linux Foundation. Uh, so this is an introductory talk and uh, we're just gonna start at the beginning. We'll talk about uh, typical graph use cases, what brought us uh, in IBM to the graph, um, some of the open source graph evolution we've seen over the years. I've been involved in this space uh, probably since 2013 or so, uh, and where we see uh, Janus Graph progressing. Uh, we've been at the Linux Foundation since 2016 and uh, continuing to grow, even though it's still a relatively small project. So we're going to be talking about graphs today. We're not talking about graphs in the sense of a bar graph or a pie graph. We're talking about more of the mathematical graph, mathematical graph, specifically a property graph model. It contains vertices, edges, and properties. We're going to go into these more in depth on the next slides. Um, this here is the typical example that we show in Janus Graph. This is called our graph of the gods. And it, it's a rich model. It, it connects different types of objects or vertices, those are your entities in the graph, uh, through edges, which would be the relationships. So specifically, the vertex, it's the entity in graph. Um, it always has an identifier and a label. Um, and it can, it can be connected. It doesn't have to be connected to other edges in the graph. Obviously, the most value is if it is connected to other vertices uh, via an edge. You can also have additional properties on it uh, these are, um, we'll, we'll see on the next slide, with, with edges, so edges, these connect your entities, so it's a directional relationship. Now this is key, um, you have uh, the, the, the out vertex, this is your source, um, it connects to the in vertex, which would be your target. So in this example here, we have the father edge, it comes from the father and it points towards, or it starts at the son and would be pointing towards the father, or the child pointing towards its father. Edges are similar to vertices in that they have an identifier and a label, um, and they can also have uh, properties as well. Um, you can also have multiple edges between the same vertices, um, and you can have edges between a vertex and itself, uh, a self-directed edge. Um, the way that you work through a graph is through these edges. Uh, so being able to jump from one vertex to another, that, that's what we call a traversal. And then again, properties. Uh, again, these are on both vertices and edges. Um, it, these are typically how you store additional data. Uh, so more specific uh, attributes that would help differentiate uh, one vertex from another or one edge from another. Uh, typically, these are Simple key value pairs, uh, you can have a collection of items as your value, whether it's a set or a list. Um, so what we like about graph, uh, specifically the property graph model, it, it's very rich compared to what you have in a relational model. Um, because it's, uh, you don't have to predefine the scheme up front uh, like you would with a relational database. It's very easy to connect data uh, add additional later uh, as it comes available. Um, and it, it, the, the flexibility is, is really what attracted us to it. Um, being able to connect data to each other as more relationships or more uh, properties are become available, um, that gives you a lot of flexibility to uh, get your data together and run an analysis on it. One of the first use cases that we had um, was around engagement analytics. In IBM, we use a product called IBM Connections. It's our, our social product. Uh, it has uh, 
forum posts, it has blogs, it has file sharing, uh, those sorts of activities. And we've been using this product for years internally, and we, we just wanted to be able to derive more value out of it. Um, the interesting thing about the IBM X Connection product is that each of those uh, applications that I had mentioned, forums and blogs, et cetera, uh, they were all uh, developed independently using a relational database. So their data was siloed. Uh, so there wasn't that opportunity to really understand how people were interacting with each other across the whole suite of applications. By putting that data into a graph, we were able to easily connect that kind of a data. So here we can see some of the relationships that we were able to gather uh, through work of putting the data into the graph and through uh, analysis from our data scientists of how different teams were connecting with each other. Um, now how this can be interesting is that you can uh, better identify different clusters of expertise, uh, whether it's regional or by technology. Um, you can identify who are the information brokers, who are the people that actually connect those pockets of information that would be strategic that to be working together better. Um, where we found that to be interesting, uh, uh, those connector people, those um, they're very valuable to the company. So from a from an employee respect, retaining those people uh, became uh, an interesting proposition because uh, typically what we would find is that if those people, those highly connect, those central people. Uh, that are able to connect diverse teams, those are the ones that are valuable. If they leave the company, they're more likely to take the senior technical people away with them <laughs> to their next job. Um, so uh, the, the idea of retention uh, of your resources uh, was very interesting. Uh, more at an individual level, we, we thought it would be valuable also to give some information back to the, the people who are using the social uh, tools um, to really understand what kind of value that they're driving both for themselves and for the company by using the, the connections collaboration tool. So here, this is a po personal social dashboard using the same exact data, uh, but more geared towards the individual so that they can better understand how they were contributing uh, through the social tooling and how that connected them to other people. So here along the bottom, we have scores based on how they were able to share with other people, what kinds of people reacted to the things that they were posted. Uh, eminence is more of a, a measure of how, how more broadly you, your, your posts were shared uh, by your peers and obviously your network. This is you know, pretty common these days. Um, and you know, one of the, the big uh, aspects that we had to consider with building this uh, was the idea of privacy as well. Uh, people were very concerned up front, uh, what if my manager sees this? Uh, they, they were afraid that it was going to be uh, you know, possibly a, a performance indicator. But really the, the idea was to give a personal um, feedback loop so you can understand well, you know, what are your gaps, where, you can, where should you look for mentoring, where should you look for training? And because uh, in, in the spirit of openness, uh, having that feedback loop really would help. Next use case we ran into was around airline routing. Uh, we worked with a major uh, airline in the United States uh, on this. Uh, IBM is, you know, they, they are currently running a lot of the back end systems for the airlines routing right now uh, on the mainframe. Um, but but uh, the, what we wanted to see was, you know, how how easy would it be to get that data into a graph database? So that way, when the airline needs to worry about routing a passenger, say when uh, uh, their flight gets delayed or it gets canceled, you know, what would be the next route to go from one hop to another? This graph here is actually a representation of the geo coordinates of all the the airports in the graph. Uh, it was generated by uh, one of my colleagues, and we actually use this ultimately as a learning tool inside the company to help teach people how to use a graph and how to uh, understand. I mean, since it's pretty simple to see how how well connected everything is, um, the uh, the and it's it's relatable from a personal level. <laughs> the the travel aspect of 
being you know, delayed at an airport and trying to understand how to jump from one to another. Um, you know, what other rules do you have to put on top of that? You know, if, if I need to connect from the United States to China, I might not want to transit through Canada because that would require perhaps other, um, you know, visa restrictions. Uh, next, uh, cloud databases. Th this is a photo from our uh, cloud offering. Uh, in 2015, we, we acquired a couple uh, cloud-based uh, database companies. Uh, one was Cloud and one was Compose. Uh, Compose is our portfolio of uh, managed open source databases. And we added Janus Graph or, uh, into that um, as another open source offering. Because uh, I, I think what we were finding with our customers is that uh, open source databases are great. Uh, running them in the cloud is uh, another story, and being able to uh, have a 24 by 7 managed uh, cloud offering uh, lowered the bar uh, in terms of them being able to adopt open source databases. Uh, you know, many of our customers are big companies that are you know, well entrenched in older technologies, so um, having a lightweight uh, model for them to play with an open source database on the cloud uh, was great. Uh, we had some additional features on top, such as the visualization browser below, which allowed them to better understand how their data was connected once they put it into the graph. Um, that's out there right now if you go out there to compose.com. But typically what we found is that uh, w once we started seeing a graph, it, it was easy to find a graph in many different areas. Um, just because in the graph database space, we, we like to say that the graph itself is, it's a whiteboard friendly type of model. It's easy to understand once you get up to the whiteboard to draw the your vertices, your nodes, your entities, and then just connect them. Um, so it gets pretty addictive and, you know, that's typically one of the first things that people want to see. They say, well, where's my graph? Let me see it. Because once you can visualize it, you, you can better understand your data. So moving on to how we progressed in the open source. Uh, one of the first projects uh, that we got involved with was Tinkerpop. Uh, when we were thinking about doing graph, uh, you know, the first thing we did obviously was go out to the open source to see what was going on. And what we found at the time was that all of the open source, or all of the graph databases were, were actually implementing this open source stack called Tinkerpop. Um, it was a vendor neutral um, open source project um, was created by Marco Rodriguez and they were all implementing the stack um, and that was great that gave us the flexibility to uh, use the same model and uh, compare the performance characteristics of different uh, graph databases at the time and uh, what was going on was pretty amazing because the the implementation of this open source project it was being done by both proprietary and by open source databases. Um, and, and that was great. So Tinkerpop itself, it provides uh, the graph model definition, it provides a graph server, it provides uh, the graph traversal language, which we're gonna go into more depth in the next few slides. Um, so we worked with Marco and his team to get them moved into open governance at the Apache Software Foundation, uh, so they went into Apache uh, top level, uh, I think in 2015, and they're continuing to grow. Um, uh, many of the major graph vendors, graph database vendors, are still implementing the Tigner Park stack today. Neo4j is probably the biggest graph database right now that people may know about. Um, but other big entries are the DataSax Enterprise Graph, Microsoft has a cloud managed Azure Cosmos database. It does graph and other uh, different styles of NoSQL databases um, and Amazon Neptune, uh, which notably does uh, property graphs and RDF graphs. Uh, RDF graphs are the, uh, it's the uh, semantic web uh, type of graph. So we talked a little bit about um, the graph structure before and now with Gremlin, Gremlin is a domain-specific language for graphs. It, it defines how you would walk um, from one vertex to another uh, along the edge. So that's what a traversal is. Uh, and Gremlin, uh, you've seen his uh, character, and he's 
part of the documentation actually from Tinkerpop. Um, I, I didn't mention before, but I'm a PMC member on uh, Apache Tinkerpop. Uh, so we, we use um, Gremlin, uh, the, the characters, all, all through our documentation. It, it helps to make concepts more approachable. Uh, the uh, Marco, the, our founder, he uh, he actually worked with a graphic designer up front to uh, use the characters so that way to um, to make it more relatable uh, and pretty much just tell the story um, of Graph. And I, I think it's been pretty pretty effective. So we're going to go through a an example of a graph traversal. So. Uh, the graph here is a pretty simple graph. I don't know if you can read all the details on it, but uh, this is uh, the Tinkerpop modern graph. It's a very simple graph, six vertices, six edges. It contains people and software. So some of the people know each other and some of the people created uh, some software projects. So when I t work with teams who want to work with a graph, we always say, well, what information do you want to get out of the graph? So the best way to do that is just to speak it in your language. What projects did Margot's colleagues create with others? And this is what the, the query looks like in Gremlin right here. And we're going to take that step by step and kind of break down what each uh, step does. Uh, Gremlin itself contains probably about 60 different steps, uh, but they break down to five different categories. Um, but it's a... Um, it's a Turing complete language. It, it's pretty flexible, and uh, it, a lot of interesting things are happening in the Tinkerpop space. So we'll start at the top, g.v. So g, uh, that stands for the graph traversal source. Um, basically, that's your graph. Um, dot v would be all the vertices. So I've designated here with the little green guys, the little gremlins in each node. So when you call g.v, now we have a traverser, you know, a little gremlin who's going to walk at each vertex. The next step is has name Marco. So this is a filter step, and what it will do is it will select only the vertices which have the name of Marco. So here, the only green guy left is over here, the Marco node. All the other traversers, they have been killed. So you can see what the problem is here, is that with the g.v uh, in the previous step, we selected all the vertices, and now we only have one left. Um, if you have a large graph, that is not very efficient. It works fine in a six-node graph, but if you have millions of nodes, that, that's a bit of a problem. So typically what you'll see in a graph database implementation is that um, you'll have an index. Um, so here we have uh, utilize index on property name to do this. So it'll go directly to that one node. So indexes will increase that performance, being able to zoom in on a single node instead of doing a full scan. Beautiful. All right, so next we're moving out on the nose edge. So starting from here, um, from the Marco node, what happens is the traverser, um, splits. He splits um, across both of these edges. So he knows two edges. So now we have uh, an alive gremlin here and a live gremlin here. Now we need to see who he created or, or what projects were created. So following along the created edge here, so out E, we're only looking at the edge because we're going to, in the next step, filter on properties on that edge where the weight is less than one. So this has a weight of one. Only this, only this uh, gremlin is still alive. Following inward towards the target vertex. So the gremlin moves from the edge to this vertex. Emit the values of the name. So here we can see that the name of this software project is LOP. So that's just one way to walk through this graph. Uh, we could have gone through a different direction. We could have done this in many different ways, just like any other you know, lang programming language for that matter. Uh, but that just gives you a flavor of how um, you would do a walk. So that covers Tinkerpop. Um, 
but going deeper, you still Tinkerpop doesn't provide a, a full implementation of a graph databases. And that's where we turn to something called TitanDB. Uh, this fills in the gaps uh, that Tinkerpop leaves behind. Um, so this was actually a project that created by Marco Rodriguez and uh, his partner, Matthias Brokler. Uh, it was the full implementation uh, of a graph database. Uh, again, it was an open source project, Apache licensed um, by this one consulting firm, uh, Aurelius. Uh, but what happened was, you know, they, they were getting good adoption from the community, but they got acquired by uh, Datastax in 2015. Uh, when they got acquired, uh, they, they kind of left the community hanging. They didn't say what the future of the project was going to be. So even though it was still open source, uh, development had slowed down significantly. And meanwhile, they released Datastax Graph 1. <laughs> so um, the community was left hanging out there, not sure what to do. Uh, we knew you know, from being in the community long enough that there were plenty of other companies out there that were in the same boat that we were, that we were using this great Titan DB product, and we wanted a, an alternative. Um, oh, I, I should mention that Data Stacks Enterprise Graph, it, it, would, it, it was an enterprise uh, commercial license only. So we got together with some partners, and we, we made a fork of the Titan Graph database and turned it into Janus Graph at the Linux Foundation, as I mentioned, 2016. And really, the, the goal here was to reconnect the open source community and uh, embrace open governance. Uh, since we were hosted at the Linux Foundation, no single company controlled it anymore, and we can just move together um, as we were before. Uh, so we have our founders, you know, Google, IBM, Hortonworks, now Cladera, uh, a good set of companies. But I mean, since then, we've continued to add new companies and individuals as well. Uh, they're all listed there. I mean, these are big companies, uh, pretty much anyone who's looking for a scalable open source graph database, uh, Janus Graph is probably one of the top options that come to mind. Um, right now in the graph database space, most of the options are, are proprietary. Um, we're seeing some good adoption from other open source projects as well. Um, I've listed some of them here. Uh, in particular, I'd point out the ones that are actually hosted at the Linux Foundation. First is the project called Egeria. Um, it falls under the ODPI umbrella. It's for open data, uh, open metadata and governance. Um, so what you're able to do with that project is uh, keep track of uh, your data sources, add governance around it, add access control, uh, things like that. Uh, it can use Janus Graph as a primary data store um, a, as an example or because it, it has a pluggable model. Uh, ONAP, if you went to some of the keynotes earlier today, they talked a lot about how this is pretty much becoming the standard around networking. Uh, there's a component called um, active and oh no, active inventory, uh, active and available inventory um, in the ONAP project, uh, which uses a graph database to store uh, how the different network components are connected together. Uh, again, that's another classic type of graph use cases, the, the connections in a network. Um, this is a graph, uh, a slide <laughs> of the Janus Graph architecture. Uh, so uh, in addition to being an open source project with a, a good open source license, one of the key things that we liked about uh, Titan and now Janus Graph was uh, the flexibility of it. So here in this diagram, the, the light green uh, items, those actually come out of the Tinkerpop project. Uh, the, the Tinkerpop APIs, the structure and the language. Um, but this, these darker green boxes, this is what Janus Graph provides. It provides a management layer for managing your schema. It provides uh, the database layer for doing transactions and data management. But probably the best part uh, for us was the, the flexible storage and indexing layer. So this is an abstraction that allowed us to experiment, again, uh, with different storage backends. So uh, on the storage backends, we have Apache Cassandra, HBase, Berkeley DB. Um, since then, we've added backends for, uh, I believe there's 
many others. There's Foundation DB, Scylla DB. Uh, it goes on and on. Uh, what, what's great about that is that you can take advantage of the skills that you have already. So if you already have skills or you already have a data center of HBase, you can use that and you can do graph on top of it. Or if you wanted to, say, compare the performance characteristics of Cassandra versus HBase, you can do that. Um, Google, our partner, they they have Google Cloud Bigtable, which is based on the HBase spec. So um, you can move easily using Jazz Graph from on-prem to the cloud. Um, similarly for the uh, indexing backends, uh, so the reason that we have uh, different backends here for the storage and the indexing, your primary storage, th this is uh, for storing your vertices and your uh, edges. If you wanted to do things like full text search, numerical search, uh, geospatial search, uh, that's where we have additional data stored in the these other backends, whether it's Elasticsearch, Apache Solar, Lucene. Um, so again, the, you, you have the flexibility again um, to use whichever backend. Uh, from a community perspective, the most popular are, are Cassandra uh, and Elasticsearch. So again, the key benefits here again is it, the, the licensing. That, that's number one. Uh, having a, a, a free software license uh, that's permissive and lets you do what you want with it. Uh, right now in the database space, there are a lot of vendors like uh, MongoDB and Elasticsearch that are starting to move more towards a restrictive license uh, to, to protect you know, how they want to operate. Um, but with the Apache license, you can do whatever you want with this software. And you know, not having one company uh, leading it uh, just means that it will always be open for you to use and collaborate with. Uh, I already talked about the pluggable storage options. Uh, I, we, we found that really to be the most interesting because um, like I said, you have the choice of using either open source options, you can write, uh, use your own uh, proprietary backends, uh, whatever you need uh, to suit uh, your, your use cases. So again, uh, I'm from the open source group in, in, at IBM, and our, our commitment to open source, it, it comes down to code, content, and community. So we already talked about, you know, some of the, some of the code, you know, with Janus Graph. Um, but we, we built uh, many different assets around uh, helping people getting onboarded with Janus Graph. Uh, so I have some links down here, you can take a look. Uh, but we have some utilities, some, some blog series to help people get started. Uh, we have uh, uh, an end-to-end -end application where you can uh, ingest data, query it out. Uh, so lots of good stuff there, um, free and available um, to help you know, broaden our scope and uh, your exposure to Janus Graph. So from a project perspective, like I said, uh, we started in 2016, we're continuing to grow. We've added uh, both uh, committers and uh, technical steering committee members since the onset, many different companies have on board. Uh, but it really is just going, going continuing on with the, the, the idea of diversity. Uh, one of the key gaps that we had from the start was around client driver support. Uh, the stack is built in Java, but many of our programmers these days are working with other languages. So over the past year or so, there's been a big uh, push to get client drivers out. Uh, right now, we've already released the .NET driver. I think Python is very close to being, being done in JavaScript. Those are the top three languages that people have been asking for. Uh, different uh, platform support. Uh, most people are using Linux. So <laughs> and I'm at a Linux conference, but you know, there are still plenty of people who use Windows and those people have been looking for support. Uh, we recently released uh, Docker images for the first time, which is fantastic. Um, getting on board with that. Um, Apache Ambari, this is a uh, more for the uh, operation side of the house, being able to have an operations console to easily be able to deploy. This is good if you're using Apache HBase and solar. Uh, so you can easily have a uh, Janus graph in that environment. Uh, I talked a little bit before about the the back end support. Um, these are mostly coming from the community. So I mean, Foundation DB, Apple recently op 
open sourced this, I think, last year. And uh, one of our TSC members uh, started flushing out uh, a backend support for that database. What's interesting about Foundation DB is that they um, they used to be open source as well. Then they got bought by Apple, and then they went closed. Then Apple opened them up again. But when they were originally open source, they had a backend adapter for Titan. So yeah. it's coming full circle on them. Everyone wants to be open. <laughs> um, but really, I mean, as a database, what we want to continue focusing on is performance, so being able to benchmark. Now, this isn't necessarily benchmarking against uh, other databases. I mean, with the flexibility that you have different storage backends, I mean, I think that's really the key right now. People always ask, oh, well, which backend should I use? So, I mean, being able to be benchmark there, uh, that's something we want to focus on, that developer experience around bulk loading and uh, ETL, that, that could all use help. From an industry perspective, uh, this property graph schema working group, uh, there, there are several vendors right now who are trying to get together and get some standards around graph databases. Um, I think the outcomes from the property graph schema working group, there's going to be a W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. They're going to have a, uh, a graph uh, standard that, that, that's where we're headed with a standardized graph language. Um, and from a Janus graph perspective, you know, it's been our mission to be a open source implementation of Tinkerpop, and Tinkerpop will also be uh, compatible with that. Uh, and with that, um, thank you again for coming out. Um, you know, um, I work in the open source, I work in the open, um, Pluride J in most places. Uh, Feel free to reach out to me with any questions you have. Uh, I can take some now. But thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I want to know, uh, could you show the uh, performance benchmark of the Janus? I don't have any benchmarks with me. <laughs> um, it, it, I believe you can probably find some, <laughs> but I mean, from from a performance benchmarks, I mean, that's something I think our community can work better to publicize and produce. But right now, we don't have any benchmarking in the product at all, right? It, it's been done by other parties. Um, so I, I, I don't have that. Uh, uh, well, I want to know what's uh, the uh, difference between the uh, Janus and the uh, near 4 or the Tiger Growth, Tiger Growth? Oh, well, I mean, they're, they're, so Neo4j came about, I mean, it's probably the oldest graph database, I and mean, there's, it has, I mean, the key difference that people like to point to with uh, Neo4j is that it, it uses Cypher. They, uh, originally they were implementing Tinkerpop and they have Gremlin support, um, but over time they decided to create their own graph language called um, Cypher. Um, so that, that's one of the main differences. Um, it, it has a GPL license and once you get beyond a certain scale, um, you're required to get a commercial license. Um, but I mean, it, it's a good product. It's, I mean, as, as far as differences, I mean, it, it's single vendor controlled. So there are good things that come with that. So they have uh, more tooling available. Um, they have dedicated people to do marketing. <laughs> so um, those are some of the differences. And same with Tiger Graph. I mean, again, that's another proprietary database. Uh, again, single, single vendor, uh, commercial license. Uh, I think that they were founded by uh, former Twitter engineers. Um, so I think 
you know, when I've spoken with them, what they're trying to do is go after uh, Neo4j uh, more in the uh, large graph um, arena. And, and they have a different language. <laughs> uh, Tiger Graph does not implement Tinkerpop or OpenCypher. They have their own language. I think they call GraphQL. But again, like I mentioned before, and this is why the graph database space is still emerging. It's still, I mean, after so many years, it still isn't standardized um, like uh, the relational database with SQL is. Um, but I think moving forward with the W3C and getting onto a graph um, standard, uh, it'll help settle things in the industry or around graph databases. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.